I'm Meta Spencer, and we're going to Brighton, England now, and to see a woman I just treasure, Mary Caldor. She's a very, very wonderful person, the most courageous and interesting and innovative peacenik thinker of her day. And I really am looking forward to this conversation. I knew Mary way back when, when she was the innovator of something called the Helsinki Citizens Assembly. And uh, that was a, a major factor in my life in those days. And I wish it was still going on. Uh, so we're going to go to uh, Brighton, England, where she's um, now um, doing research in having retired from the London School of Economics and is, uh, has been uh, working on uh, collecting things uh, left by her late husband, uh, Julian Perry Robinson, uh, who I guess died of uh, COVID earlier a year or so ago. So um, it, it's been a hard year for her, but we want to move on and talk about her very important work. The time when I most recently was in touch with her writing was when she was innovating a, 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 an analysis of what she called new wars, how, how the current batch of wars differ from traditional ones. And so I want to get up to date about what she thinks of the new current uh, list of new wars. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Afghanistan, which has proved to be a big fiasco. Good morning, Mary. Hello, Meta. Very nice to see you. It's actually not morning. It's, it's, it's late here, but it must be evening for you. So anyway, glad yeah. to see you again. Okay, bring me up to date, lady, on your work on new wars. Uh, we need to tell people uh, what you, how you described the new wars a decade or so ago when you were, uh, when was it, about a decade ago that you wrote? It was longer. Uh, the first edition of the New Wars book was published in 1999. <laughs> but so there have been some newer new wars since then. Yeah. And yeah. I wonder how they fit into your description of the changes that you were observing at that time. Well, as a matter of fact, they fit extraordinarily well. Okay. Um, they are all new wars. And I think I've developed the analysis quite a lot since I first wrote the book in 1999. I mean, at that time, I was really describing the characteristics, although I was trying to argue that what was new about new wars was not so much something empirical as the logic of how they functioned. And that's become ever more clear. And I found it quite useful. If we think about, we think of old wars, as deep-rooted contests between two sides, um, and the sides were usually traditionally states. But the key was it was a deep-rooted political contest between two socially organized entities. And because each side tried to win, it was a contest that tended to the extreme. It got worse and worse. And old wars, if you like, were incredibly lethal, millions. I think during the 20th century, 150 million people died in battles in war. But they were quite short. They ended in decisive victory or defeat. Mm -hmm. New wars are very different in that they're, I think they're better described as a social condition or almost as a mutual enterprise. I think nowadays most gr armed groups try to avoid direct collisions because war is so destructive. Nevertheless, violence serves certain purposes. Uh, it serves economic purposes. They make a lot of money by simply looting people, by setting up checkpoints by hostage taking, by smuggling. Uh, and they also gain politically because the best way to have an extreme political ideology is through fear. And so these are wars in which there are numerous warring parties who are both state and non-state 
but they're less interested in winning than they are in violence for its own sake. And whereas the old wars tended to the extreme, as Clausewitz told us, these wars tend to persistence. They are the forever wars. Mm -hmm. And as I have thought about the logic, I've realized that in some senses, maybe the Cold War was the first new war in that it was a mutual enterprise in which both the Soviet Union and the United States were able to establish their dominant roles through the idea of a permanent conflict. They didn't actually want a war, but they, the idea served them. Mm -hmm. And that, in a way, is what is true also of the war on terror or the competition with China, with China and Russia. These are also forever wars. The war on terror is, if you like, the ultimate forever war in which... Mm -hmm. The military-industrial complex benefits from endless drone attacks, private security contractors, the whole business. And it doesn't destroy terrorism. It creates more terrorism, but that justifies more drone attacks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tell me now, when you did your book, uh, the main one about new wars, which wars were you referring to and which ones have occurred since then so that we can make the comparison? Because I can't remember what the cutting point was. It, it, you can well, see my memory was uh, off by uh, several years. <laughs> my case study was Bosnia. Yeah, okay. And actually, you know, it was all the consequence of the Helsinki Citizens Assembly, actually. Mm -hmm. Because I was traveling around Bosnia as chair of the Helsinki Citizens Assembly and talking to local peace and human rights groups. And most of the ideas came from them. But I think, in fact, I started the New Walls book with Nagorno-Karabakh. Because it was when, and again, that was the Helsinki Citizens Assembly. I don't know if you ever came to the South oh. Caucasus. No, no but, not on any of those trips around the, the countryside, yeah. But anyway, when we went to the South Caucasus, I just was very struck when we went to Nagorno-Karabakh with the similarities between Nagorno-Karabakh and Bosnia. Mm -hmm. You know, this didn't look like my image of a war. You know, my image of a war was World War II. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Regular soldiers, I don't know, um, trenches. My, my image of a war is World War One, with people in trenches. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm really behind. <laughs> exactly. And this wasn't like this. There were young men in homemade uniforms, and they were very proud of their sort of contemporary symbols. They would wear Ray-Ban sunglasses or Adidas running shoes, along with their camouflage uniforms. And there were refugees milling around, hoping we would help them. And it just didn't look like the kind of war. And that was what originally gave me the idea, these are new. And at that time, I thought it was a post-communist phenomenon. And because it was Bosnia and the South Caucasus. But then I was asked by the United Nations U University to run a project. And I decided to run it on New Wars. That was the origin of New Wars. And I invited, you may know him, Alex DeWall. Oh, yes, I do know him. Uh -huh. So Alex came to tell us about wars in Africa. Uh -huh. And we were kind of very struck at the similarities between wars in Africa, wars in Bosnia, wars in Nagorno-Karabakh. And so that was the origins of, of our new wars idea. Tell and me whether, uh, having mentioned him, you know, his main interest, I think, is in famine, uh, starvation and, and deliberately induced famines, of course. And I, um, I did an interview, a talk show with him a couple of years ago, because uh, he had a new book called Mass Starvation. And, and of course, since then, there have been some other new wars where there is, again, the induction of famine, the actual creation of deliberate 
famine, Yemen being one. And I believe right now it's going on in Ethiopia. Absolutely. So, yeah. Alex and I are actually working together now again. <laughs> His latest theories of famine is that famines nowadays, we know how to deal with famines. So they only actually occur in war situations. Yeah. And he's extremely preoccupied with Ethiopia. The other thing that Alex does, which is very relevant to the whole New Wars argument, is that he's been pioneering this idea of the political marketplace, by which he means really crony capitalism. What he means is that in many of the conflicts we study, the state is basically a repository for revenues. You don't get much tax revenue, but you get aid, you get mineral revenues. And many of these wars are really about how you distribute these revenues. Okay. okay. Uh, now, had, did you include this notion of famine in your uh, own description of new wars, or is that no, kind of an appendix? Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't. But anyway, so the first book, my case study was Bosnia, but then I did, I've done two editions since of the um, new wars book, and the latest in 2012 also included a chapter on Iraq and Afghanistan as new wars. And there I was arguing that, in a sense, the United States started off in a, with an old war mentality and found themselves swept up in a new wars, in a new war. Mm -hmm. yep. In both cases, they celebrated a great victory, which they thought they'd achieved through all this new technology, but actually they were only there on the basis of consent of the population. And as they started attacking what they thought were terrorists and Al-Qaeda and goodness knows what, insurgencies developed in both countries and it ended up as a very typical new war in both cases. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, so you, you're talking about new insurgencies after the U.S. went into what they thought was a simple matter. Yeah, I mean, and it was a simple matter, actually. They invaded Afghanistan, and the Afghans were only too delighted because they got rid of the Taliban. But instead of making peace with the Taliban... and chased al-Qaeda... Uh, using airstrikes, intrusive night raids, and all of those kinds of things. And so the insurgency, the Taliban insurgency, only actually began in 2006. And it was a response to all these attacks. Okay, now that's, I guess, news to me. I, if I... If I've ever heard that before, I don't think I remember it. It was peaceful for the first five years. I think there were two problems. One was that the U.S. Went, had this counter-terror mission and was constantly trying to attack the remnants of al-Qaeda and the remnants of the Taliban. But the other, which made it even more problematic, was... Uh, in the war against the Soviets, the Mujahideen, they needed them for the war on terror. They were the private, secu they were the co security contractors. And so the US was paying them to fight the Taliban and Al Qaeda. And this was a source of huge corruption. And it insisted on bringing them into the government. So the other problem was. It was both the problem of continual attacks provoking a reaction and a problem of very considerable corruption undermining the legitimacy of the Afghan government. 
I think my confusion was that I did not see a distinction between the Mujahideen and the Taliban. I thought the Taliban were sort of the outgrowth of the Mujahideen. So you're, you're describing something quite different. Well, the, the Mujahideen, sometimes called the warlords or the commanders, who all had their own armed groups, um, they were more or less, they were defeated when the Taliban came in, when the Taliban came to power. The Taliban were very anti-corruption. They, the warlords were sharing power, the Mujahideen, in, in chaotic and corrupt ways, and the Taliban came to power. Um, and so when the Americans came in, the Americans brought back the warlords. All right. Were they part of this thing called the Northern Alliance? Yeah, they were some of them, but there were others as well. The Northern Alliance was definitely part of it. You know, I think I think what we need is a basic history. Yeah, well, I think the way in which the story of Afghanistan has been told has been really terrible. Just... And essentially, I think the problem in Afghanistan was the continued counter-terror operations. And I think most Europeans would agree with that. Okay. But the, there was a, you know... Essentially what happened was the U.S. came in, then they got the U.N. and NATO, and the U.N. and NATO had a different project. Their project was stabilizing the country. And really the stabilization project and the counter-terror project undermined, well, the the counter-terror project undermined the project of stabilization. This is really quite unique, Mary. I don't think I've heard anybody say this sort of thing. I'll send you, I've been saying it for a long time, actually, but I'll send you an article I wrote in The Guardian. Um, But what I wanted to say, and I think Europeans are quite aware of this, Um, but I think in the US, I mean, Biden was always against what he called nation building and always in favor of counter-terror. And my feeling is that it should have been exactly the other way around. He should have been against counter-terror, but nation building, well, at least nation building in the American way of thinking was very militarized. What was needed was a civilianized peace building program. Um, And that was perfectly possible. I mean, the Afghans really wanted that. Okay, you told me earlier that you you um, did have something to say about Afghanistan and about counterterrorism and about uh, your alternative. So it yes. looks like we have jumped right over a big analysis of new wars in in the earlier phase of your thinking, and we're we're talking about a much more recent period. So go right ahead. Let's let's cover this. Um, you want me to just turn on my light because I realize it's getting dark here. Yeah, and sure. I turn okay. on my... You wanted to talk about human security well, as I the, the term... antidote to uh, to the counter t- to the terrorism of the war on terror. Exactly, right? because I think our objective in Afghanistan should have been the security of Afghans. Mm-hmm. And in fact, our objection, our objective was the security of the West. And that was thought to have been achieved by killing terrorists. Okay. And killing terrorists really undermined the security of Afghans. And my feeling is that actually we live in this interconnected world where the security of Afghans is just as important as the security of Europeans and Americans. And that had we had as our primary objective the security of Afghans, uh, we would have had a very different outcome that would have actually made us safer as well. Move back. Let's talk about what counterterrorism is then. Because I would have thought probably Biden or the other people who were thinking in terms of counterterrorism 
were thinking themselves of, in a way, pro protecting Afghans from terrorists. But that, but if you were, if you were a general, American general, who in 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 the first five years of the war in Afghanistan, who would you consider your enemy? You thought was it Al, Al, Al Qaeda? Was it the Taliban? Was it some warlord? The warlords were your allies, and your enemies were the remnants of the Taliban and Al Qaeda. And my feeling is that actually it would have been much better to make peace with the Taliban and to deal with Al Qaeda through policing rather than through military means. And if you imagine that Afghanistan had been a country like Britain or Germany, can you imagine you would go around bombing little cells of terrorists? Beats me. I don't know what I would have done. The US thought it was fighting the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, though actually I think many of the warlords exaggerated the presence of ta the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in order to get money and arms from the United States. So anyway, the effect of this counter-terror was to produce a real threat. And it's not only Al-Qaeda and the Taliban now, but it's also ISIS. It's called ISIS Khorasan, but ISIS is there as well. So actually, it's made the situation much worse. And that is really true all over Africa and the Middle East. I mean, the effect of the war on terror is to produce many, many more terrorists. So ISIS now control large parts of Africa. Yeah. All right. And ISIS, uh, they, they are not called ISIS, I'm, I'm told, it's just Islamic State now. And they are not, I, I don't understand why there is this enmity between them and the Taliban. Because if they're all, it well, says that the whole country was full of different kinds, different flavors of terrorists who all hate each other as much as they hate the West. I think that's probably true. And I think this is all part of the new war analysis, that these armed groups are trying to control bits of territory. They're trying to make money. They're competing with each other. Um, they're not really trying, I mean, of course, the Taliban did in the end try to win, but um, basically it's a sort of, and I think what we'll see in Afghanistan is just more fighting with the Haqqani network, with ISIS, with the remnants of Al-Qaeda. Okay. Now, if you'd been in charge, you want human security. Tell us what that is. I think I have a few ideas, but not many people will know. And besides which, your analysis is probably a little different. What would you have done? Well, first of all, actually, I wouldn't have invaded Afghanistan. <laughs> um, I think uh, what I believe that terrorists, individual terrorists is, are not the same as a collective attack. I think the mistake was made in 2001 uh, when Bush treated the attack by the terrorists as an attack by a foreign state and declared the war on terror. I think terrorism is criminal. What happened on 9-11 uh, was a crime against humanity, but it should have been dealt with through policing and through intelligence rather than through a war. What and kind of policing? Uh, where would you get any kind of police force? The UN doesn't have anything like that. Well, let's go back a step um, to the definition of human security. Uh, you know, we have, I mean, the traditional definition of human security, which stems from UNDP's Human Development Report of 1994, 
was that human security is about the security of individuals and the communities in which they live, uh, as opposed to the security of states and borders. And it's also about security from material threats, from famine, from poverty, as well as about as well as from military threats. Mm-hmm. Now, the way I've been thinking about human security is that we have a different way of guaranteeing security domestically than we do externally. Yeah. Domestically, we maintain security through a rule of law and through police, a combination of a rule of law and effective justice systems. And internationally, we tend to think in term, in war terms. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think a human security policy in this sort of global interconnected world is really about expanding the domestic mode of security outwardly. Mm-hmm. You know, in a... In a society like Canada or the UK, um, which is a rights-based, law-governed society, we have emergency services that are available if something terrible happens. We have ambulances, health workers, firefighters, police. And I feel what we should be having internationally is something very similar for climate change disasters as well as for new wars. And these might include the military, but the military would operate in very different ways. It wouldn't be about attacking enemies. It would be about protecting people from attacks. And now some people might say, well, you need to attack enemies in order to stop them from attacking. Um, But actually what you saw in Afghanistan was that the attacks provoked counterattacks all the time. Sure. So you couldn't have had that required that kind of evidence. There's plenty of evidence throughout history that that's the case. Exactly, exactly. And so this is what I basically think we should be adjusting defence policies. And interestingly enough, it is the European Union's defence policy is based on human security. But the European Union is very ineffective and doesn't dare act without the United States. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what was interesting over Afghanistan is that they were all against them. I mean, the Americans only withdrew 2,500 troops. The problem was that Trump did a deal with the Taliban and left out the government, left out civil society, and basically agreed that the U.S. would withdraw. So many, many people in Afghanistan and agreed that the Taliban would ally with them because the Taliban don't actually attack the United States and Europe. And so they don't really care what the Taliban does to Afghans. And the Taliban would ally with them in defeating al-Qaeda and ISIS. And that is essentially what has happened. Back up and fill me in a little more. I'm not getting a complete picture of this. I'm stuck back there where you're talking about this, this uh, the equivalent of a police service, uh, other emergency oh, yeah. services. So let's well, go back to that because. My interest is in this. You know, we have this thing called Project Save the World, and we have a platform for survival. And number uh, one very important key part of the, the idea is to have the United Nations have an emergency peace force. Absolutely. Service, which yes. would be, so, I'm, I'm thinking, is, is, is Mary talking about this peace service that we have in mind. I am talking about the peace service, but I think I'm using the term human security to describe it, but I could equally call it a peace service. We talk about common, sustainable common security is the language we talk about, but it's the same idea, I think. I mean, I do, I like the human security because, actually, funnily enough, we did this report for when Javier Solano was the high representative, where we first put forward the idea of a human security doctrine for Europe. And we were describing all this 
and we didn't know what to call it, and we agreed to call it human security. I mean, we could have called it something else. But, but you're any- saying that the, the, the EU's policy is along those lines, but it, uh, we thought of it as primarily a United Nations uh, outfit and not at, almost as an alternative to national armies. Absolutely. And the EU's policy is along those lines and within the framework of the UN. So in the early days, there were quite a few, there have been quite a lot of EU missions, actually. And one of them, just to give you one example, the anti-piracy mission in the Gulf was a real success. We don't hear about it Mm -hmm. because it was so successful. Okay. And that was an EU mission. I, I think that. authorized by the UN. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and they were, you know, that first of all, they were arresting pirates and not killing them. Mm-hmm. And secondly, they were trying to do, along with the arrest of pirates, they were establishing a system of fishing licenses along the coast of Somalia. Mm-hmm. So it's a really nice example of the kind of thing you can do. Mm-hmm. What about in a new war situation where there's real violence? I mean, again, I think the way to go is through multi-level peace building, which is backed up by a combination of the police and the military. But, I mean, this sounds like a really odd example, but... Actually, General Petraeus in Baghdad managed to reduce the violence dramatically in 2007 to 8. And he did it by negotiating over 300 local agreements. And US forces were in there together with Iraqi security forces, and they upheld the local agreements. I mean, you so said the kind- 300 agreements? He went door to door collecting agreements, practically. What soldiers did. They put soldiers in police stations across Baghdad. Mm-hmm. I mean, as it happened, this was the moment when, I don't know if you remember, but there was these sons of Iraq who were Sunnis who wanted to separate themselves from al-Qaeda. And so it was a very good moment because they wanted to end the war and they were prepared to make deals with Shiite groups in order to stop the violence. And uh, But the role of the internationals, in this case it was Americans, was extremely important as mediators and as people who could uphold those local agreements. And I think a similar approach could have been done very effectively in Afghanistan. But you said 300 agreements. Uh, That is uh, quite amazing. Uh, How how would you even find 300 different groups that you could negotiate with? In little areas. These are wars where you have very localized armed groups. And interestingly enough, there have been something, I mean, one of the characteristics of new wars is that you have a lot of local agreements because there are so many different armed groups and they sometimes agree among themselves for tactical reasons. They might agree, for instance, in Syria, they agree about the, in the, when ISIS was there, ISIS controlled the oil. Uh, the government controlled the electricity and the Al-Qaeda, the Nusra groups, controlled the water. And they made agreements to sort of exchange <laughs> services. <laughs> okay. So sometimes you have real ag- peace agreements. They're rather rare, but agreements where civilians are involved and they agree for a ceasefire. Uh, and that's quite durable. But sometimes there are agreements about redeployment of troops, there are agreements about exchanges of services. But what we found in our research, and this is particularly true in Africa, that where the UN gets involved in these local agreements, they tend to insist on more civilian involvement and they tend to 
to last longer. And that's a really interesting conclusion. So internationals can play quite a constructive role in making these local agreements more uh, Mm -hmm. peace-oriented. We did have a conversation uh, while the early uh, part of the Syrian war was going on. And at that point, you had, I thought, a, a, a very constructive notion which I, I was surprised hadn't been adopted, which was to, to create an enclave or something for, for Syrians to go to that could be protected by peacekeepers and uh, defended if necessary, but that people coming in would have to leave their weapons outside. Do you recall? Well, um, I do recall that. And, you know, I'm, I'm still, I think that's something we could also have done in Afghanistan, create safe havens and safe areas for people to go to. And in fact, the UN again, I mean, there, there's lots of criticisms of them, but in South Sudan, when the fighting was on, people fled to UN encampments. And that resulted in these protection of civilian sites. Now, you said that you're studying a series of, what, four or five other wars now as um, the current crop of new wars. Uh, (laughs) Which ones are they? You you mentioned Sudan. Um, Which which are the countries you've been studying? Well, in the last phase of our program, it was DRC, Somalia, South Sudan, Syria, and Iraq. And now we're entering a new phase where it's going to be Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, Syria, Iraq, and I hope Afghanistan. Okay. What, what's been left and what's been added? Uh, I think DRC we're no longer doing. Okay. And Sudan and Afghanistan. Uh, bring me up to date. What has happened that's changed uh, the situation in DRC? Nothing has happened. It's British government priorities. But nothing, it's still war. It's still war. It's still terrible. It still continues. Right. Okay. Okay. So, all right. Now, what, what in general can you say that if there are any differences between now and the earlier new wars analysis... What has changed? Is there anything, or would you say they're all pretty much following the pattern that you described? I think what's changed is that the UN is much weaker and that external powers are getting involved. So I think the big change was the invasion of Iraq which in a way discredited UN-type interventions. Do you remember we had that big discussion about humanitarian intervention? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a lot of people, progressive people like you and me, were in favour of it. But when Iraq happened, suddenly it discredited the idea of humanitarian intervention and people lost their taste for UN involvement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so... I think war, but what we're seeing in places like Syria and Yemen and Ethiopia is the tragedy of lack of UN involvement, because these wars are far worse uh, than some of the earlier new wars. I mean, there are far more casualties, far more refugees. And, you know, the use of chemical weapons, the bombing of hospitals and schools, it's just horrible what's going on. Okay, now the UN has basically no role in Afghanistan, as far as I know. Oh, yes, it does. And it's staying even with the Taliban. So when the the UN was there before 2001, after 2001, and NATO moved into Um, Afghanistan under a UN mandate and the UN mandate was stabilization so there were two commands in Afghanistan there was ISAF the International 
Security Assistance Force, I think it was stood for, under a UN mandate. And there was uh, the American command, Operation Enduring Command or something like that, and that was the counter-terror operation and that had nothing to do with the UN. And that was the big problem. Then about two years ago, they wound down both and the American and NATO presence was purely a training presence. But nevertheless, the Americans continued together with the Afghans, the counter-terror role. All right. So you say the UN has a role, but, but it sounded like they, it, it, from what you said subsequently, that they deputized subgroups to, to do their function for them. This, uh, the UN was really undermined by the counter-terror role. I mean, I was saying that uh, the counter-terror was problematic because it provoked counter-reactions. It was problematic because it encouraged um, corruption. It was also problematic because the civilian role of the UN special representative was totally sidelined. And the UN had very little power. Well, see, I, I told you right then, I don't think they're even there. So you see how much I know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if they're there, what are they doing? Uh, and, and how well, much are I they? Think in Afghanistan what... was not, I mean, it's, you know, in terms of casualties and all of those things, was not on the scale of Syria or Yemen. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, I had a friend, a woman who was there at uh, representing UN women. So I think oh, yeah. that, that maybe were they doing that kind of thing? They were doing that kind of thing. They were doing development staff. They were doing women in, women's empowerment, civil society, uh, a lot of projects of that kind. So this kind of thing is what you'd like to have seen massively done. Right. It was massively done, but its effects, it was massively done. And we shouldn't forget that there have been some tremendous gains in Afghanistan in terms of education, women's rights, all of those things. Um, but it was constantly undermined by the war on terror, mm -hmm. continuing war on terror. Okay. Would they, would the UN or whatever uh, left uh, these subgroups of or agencies of the UN or whatever you want to call them, uh, could they still function in, in, under a Taliban government? Could, has the UN even attempted to? Well, the UN to, wants to, and there's a big debate going on at the moment because they feel there's a huge need to provide humanitarian assistance. Mm -hmm. And the UN is planning on staying. Uh, and during the Taliban, previous Taliban period, actually the UN was based in Pakistan, but nevertheless, there were quite a few UNDP programs through. Afghan NGOs that were operating inside Afghanistan. But now, and this is there's a big debate about this going on, I think the UN want to recognize the Taliban so they can provide humanitarian assistance. I'm against this. I think they can talk to the Taliban about providing humanitarian assistance, but they shouldn't recognize them without talks with all the other actors in Afghanistan. Okay. Uh, who are these other actors? Well, the remnants of the government uh, and civil society, which is quite powerful now. You know, there is continuing civil society protests and women's protests, really courageous and brave mm -hmm. inside Afghanistan, and the Taliban should be talking to them. You think they would? No. No. But I think the UN should be putting pressure on them to do so, and so should other uh, regional powers. Well, the only dynamic that I have seen is people talking about how much to offer cooperation and aid to the Taliban government uh, 
if they will behave themselves. And then the, the question is what kind of a deal could maybe be made? And that seems very un, unclear so far. Yeah, well, I think there need to be talks with other actors before they make any deal with the Taliban. But that doesn't mean they shouldn't be talking to the Taliban about very practical things on the ground, about how to, they've got a lot of leverage because they control central bank assets. The Taliban desperately need their humanitarian assistance. So, you know, they could be just negotiating about improving the situation on the ground and say no political recognition until there have been more inclusive talks. Who listens to you? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, well, actually, um, quite a lot of people do. They, I mean, a lot of, I, I talk a lot, obviously, to the Foreign Office, the British Foreign Office, and I think among civil servants, there's a lot of sympathy for this position. But you know, we, the British government is what well, we, you know, we have a very problematic government at the moment. Uh, but apart from that, the British military industrial complex is so integrated into the American military industrial complex that Britain very rarely does things independently of the United States. Um, then, of course, I am talking to NATO, and this is something that I think you'll find interesting. Much to my amazement, NATO has established a human security unit. Which sounds like your notion of human security or something? No, it doesn't. Um, basically, it's an umbrella for protection of civilians for a whole lot of things. Protection of civilians, cultural protection of cultural heritage, dealing with human trafficking, dealing with gender-based violence, the women, peace and security agenda. And actually what you see inside NATO is a kind of ambiguity about what all this means, because for some, these are things you do alongside military operations. Mm -hmm. So for example, to take the Afghan example again, there was a lot of pressure on NATO to minimize civilian casualties. And if you look at the numbers, actually in the last few years, NATO operations have been very, that had, they had a big reduction in civilian casualties. But of course, from an Afghan perspective, since a NATO attack produces a Taliban counterattack where civilians are killed, it doesn't make much difference. So I think you can't think of these, th you can't think of human security as a bundle of nice things that go alongside military operation. You have to think of human security as a different way of doing military operations. And some soldiers who've been in Afghanistan and elsewhere really understand that. And it's much better understood in European governments than it is in the US. And so this is why, I mean, I spoke at a NATO meeting and made these points, and this is why they asked me to write a policy brief on human security for NATO. And what I've tried to say is that not only human security is obviously a policy for crisis management, but actually, it's also affects NATO, what NATO sees as its core mission, collective defense. And that goes back to all the discussions we had during the Cold War about how you could deter an attack by having a defensive posture and not having weapons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That actually our NATO posture provided legitimation for the Soviet Union and that is still tr equally true today with, when we're talking about Russia or China. So, I mean, I think Russia and China are dangerous powers, but military competition of the kind we're engaging in now is just provocative. It just helps them legitimize what they're doing. And so we also need to change the posture 
on the mainland of Europe and not just in terms of crisis management. So that's what I've been arguing for NATO. Oh, you mean for think- NATO? I'm sorry, but you're talking about NATO wants you to talk about how a, a policy for defending Europe, not policy for places like Afghanistan. They were expecting me to write about policies for places like Afghanistan, and I've written about both. Okay, all right. Because, you know, when when you talk about, uh, you know, defensive military uh, equipment, et cetera, only, uh, non-provocative defense kinds of of, uh, preparedness, I I guess that makes sense if you're talking about defending against another state that might attack, you know, an alien coming in, but how would that work if you're talking about a place like Afghanistan, where, the, the, as you talk about it, the, their local uh, the patchwork of uh, warlords or of different uh, competing um, interests, ISIS versus the Taliban mm-hmm. versus uh, Al Qaeda versus all, all of these other things. Uh, 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 I don't see how a defensive military posture would would work against a kind of local insurgencies and so on? Well, I think it would because, you know, essentially attacks on the Taliban and al-Qaeda were provoking the insurgency. So I think it would need to be defending people against attack, making it difficult to be attacked, trying to provide security at a local level, which also might involve making local agreements. So, you know, I think the key thing is that, if you like, at a higher conceptual level, that basically we're saying that the security of Europeans and security in the European mainland, we're saying the security of Russians and Chinese matter as much as the security of Europeans and Americans. The old war perspective was that the security of Europeans and Americans mattered much more than the security of Europeans and Russians. And although you shouldn't kill civilians, if they get caught in the crossfire, it's okay. Uh, Whereas I'm saying it's not okay. Mm -hmm. You have to take a whole different approach. And uh, the same is true in Christ. The same is true in places like Afghanistan, where the security of Afghans is the thing that matters the most. You know, the thing I like about your work, Mary, is that it, you, you come at it from a, a, such a different perspective. I mean, I, most peace activists think in terms of how you prevent a war by being nice to each other, negotiating in advance, and, and so on. But when it, after a war has started, We have nothing to say about how to get out of it or how to wage it in a way that's humane or how to protect people in the middle of it, et cetera. I I mean, peace activists that I know, and I'm I'm, I'm surrounded by them, really have nothing to say about warfare, uh, you know, how to improve warfare. And, and well, what I'm you not do... suggesting improving warfare, but I'm suggesting what we do recognize is that we have to be able to deal, you know, being nice to the Russians or the Chinese isn't necessarily a solution because the Russians and the Chinese are not nice to people living in Crimea or people living in Xinjiang. And so we have to be able to deal with that and address it and take it seriously. Indeed. But but you've got strategies, you see. Exactly. Well, that's that is, my... uh, what is unusual, because honestly, uh, I have, you've been in the last half hour, been saying things that I have not heard anybody else say, either my peace activist friends, or of course, people in the regular mainstream, either government or the military or even the, the main press, you know, the, the pundits and so on. Nobody's talking the way you are. And you have a dozen good ideas, which um, that question now is, um, to my mind, how to, you know, 
why aren't there more Mary Caldors in the world? <laughs> I hope there are going to be more. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in terms of your own work, do you think that in, that you say NATO is listening to you? Uh, already there's another interesting point that I was, I have not tried to imagine how NATO works. I assume that, so far as I can tell, when the U.S. says something, all the other countries in NATO say, oh, yes, sir. And, they do. And they do. But they you know, different European countries, you know, the port, just to give you one example, the Portuguese War College has written a whole book on new war theory. Oh, really? All right. So within European states, there's a lot of interest in these ideas. And so I guess what I'm trying to do is to encourage Europeans to try to be, I mean, I think Afghanistan was a terrible shock for all of them because they really did disagree with the US about Afghanistan and the US took no notice. Well, certainly they did, the US took no notice and, and nor did anybody I know. So. Exactly. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, you know what? Think now as, as somebody trying to organize alternatives, uh, uh, promote alternative perspectives, which I'm sure you obviously do. How do we publicize your ideas, for example? How, uh, how do we get somebody talking along the lines that that you've proposed, okay? It's, Suppose we yeah. have a, a seminar, a webinar, something where we take take each of your proposals and analyze them and get some other people talking about them. And could we could we make a conversation? What I'm hearing is you you've got some good ideas, but this is not a conversation with. I mean, not with me. We need a, a larger d discourse about. The, the 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 whole approach the human human security approach um, i think what you know within sort of aid agencies ngos those kinds of groups the un a lot of these ideas are present i mean the un has learned a lot from the last few years um but i think the real problem is the political class the political class have this idea that all the population want is a strong country, you know. We just yeah. had an election and you would not know that there was anything outside of Canada. in The, the rest of the world didn't exist. It's all domestic issues. The international affairs yeah. are nowhere in the, in the picture. It was lovely to see you. Yeah, we'll pick it up and go forward if... Okay. If you can think of a way in which Peace Magazine or Project Save the World or these talk shows can be of any value, let me know. I will. I okay. definitely will. All right. Bless you. Thanks, Mary. Bye. Bye.